Hi there, are you planning on applying for a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship? However, you don't know where to start or what to do? Actually, don't worry, I've been there and I know how it feels. And that is why today I decided to make this video to share with you some tips that I have found very useful during my process in this journey. Hello, I'm Yvette and in 2020 I applied for the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship and I was awarded one. My application falled under the Life Science section, as I am a neuroscientist. However, these 10 tips that I'm going to share with you today do not apply only for the Life Science applicants. In the past couple of years, many friends and colleagues have approached me to help them out with their application and so I decided to make this video as I thought that these tips are also of interest to people outside of my circle of friends. So here come the 10 tips for you today. Tip 1. Recognize you need to put in the hard work. First of all, you have to realize that the MSCA grant requires a lot of hard work on your part. I know, probably you've heard of this already. However, I just want to make sure that you're understanding the magnitude of it all. I have heard way too many aspiring applicants dismiss the amount of work that needs to be done. And then they realize that quite late in the day that this is not true. I have heard comments like, this is not my first grant application, or I already wrote a grant for this project, so all I need to do is to expand the existing grant to fit the page limit of the MSA grant. And unfortunately, these are all false. Have you heard someone say one of these comments? Or even maybe, have you told one of these comments to yourself? If so, you know that tip number one is for you. And it is practically telling you, stop kidding yourself. And in big capital letters. At the time that I had applied for this grant, I was already successful in other grants for my master and also for my PhD. However, it wasn't an easy task to get this one right. So to understand this, let's talk numbers. Every year, the European Commission announces the budget allocated for such funding. And after the applications are reviewed and evaluated, the Commission decides on the grading cutoffs. That is, how many of these applications will be awarded this year. So as you can imagine, the numbers are not always the same. However, on average, the success rate for an MSCI grant is around 15%, where in 2022, the success rate ranged from 2% till 25%, of course, depending on the fee considering that the MSCA receives around 7,000 to 10,000 applications per year, with the exception of the COVID year in 2020 where they received over 11,000 applications, and only around 1,000 to 2,000 applicants are successful, one can just imagine the number of rejected applications per year. Just to give you an idea, the amount of people rejected can fill a decent-sized stadium. Moreover, an application which is rated 85% or higher is considered acceptable and in fact you will be awarded the seal of excellence. However, the MSCA is so competitive that in general you have to have scored 90% or higher in order to be awarded the grant. So having said this, I do hope that I did not discourage you from applying. However, I do hope that these statistics serve as a wake-up call so that you can stop fooling yourself and realize that in order to be successful you have to put in the time and effort from your side. Just remember, the other applicants are exceptional candidates like you. And usually, what makes a successful application of a rejected one is the attention to detail. So tip number two, start today. So now that we recognize the intensity of this application, my second tip is to just start today. Actually, it would have been great to start when the open call was announced. But hey, you cannot be a scientist without a little bit of procrastination, right? So yeah, the second best time is to start today then. So the idea is that the more time you have to work on it, the better your application will become. And trust me, you will need that time. So give yourself time to craft the first draft. However, also make sure that you have time to implement the suggestions from your supervisor and your host institution. Preferably, you leave enough time so that this review process will take place at least twice. So for me, a great way to mark the beginning of this journey was to start the application process on the portal. In order to do so, you have to declare your interest to your supervisor, host institution and also have a little abstract ready. So don't be like me and worry about the abstract because this can be changed later. I know, starting the process on the portal sounds like a lot. However, like this, you are not just committing to yourself, but also to the ones around you. And that will put you in the right headspace to start writing. So having said that, let's start now. Tip number three, contact host institution contact point. 
So now that we've covered starting, the next thing that you should do, assuming that you already have a project and a supervisor, is to contact the MSCA contact point of the host institution. Usually universities have a team of people dedicated to help you and guide you throughout this whole process. For example, in LMU, which is my host institution, this team hosted seminars, workshops, and even offered services like individual consultation and also reviewing of the application. Of course, if sent in due time. Personally, I found this contact point extremely helpful, and I have to admit, I don't think that I would have been been successful without their input. For example, in the beginning, they sent a handbook with tips how to formulate your ideas and also to what level of detail one needs to go down to. This is very useful, as in the beginning when you're starting to fill in the different sections, you find out that some sections seem to be quite repetitive. And, for example, at the end, they really helped with making my proposal more a messy style. So, I have nothing more to add other than just contact them as early as you can. Tip number four, observe the deadlines. It goes without saying that you send your proposal to your supervisor to correct it. However, one thing that many scientists are skeptical doing is to send their application to the host institution contact point. Sometimes scientists feel that a person who does not work in their field cannot give relevant advice on their proposals. However, this cannot be further from the truth. For sure, the comments from your supervisor are invaluable, especially when it relates to the scientific part of the project. However, it is the people at the contact point who are really familiar with the application and how it should be structured. If you are one of those tactics, all I can tell you is this, just give it a try and see what sort of comments you get. No one is gonna force you to apply those suggestions. However, just give it a try, please. Just remember, the application is 9 pages long, and if every one of the applicants in that host institution sends it at the very end, they will not be able to deliver on their comments to everyone. So usually contact points set certain deadlines for particular services that they offer. So my advice for you over here is be familiar with the deadlines and make use of all the services being offered. Tip number 5. Unlearn all the misconceptions. At any time, before, during, or even after your Marie Curie application process, you will hear some common sayings from people around you. And trust me, even if they are common, they are not necessarily right. So let's just go through a few of them which are really at the top of my mind. However, I'm sure that there are more, and if you want to share them and discuss, please leave a comment down below. So let's start with the first one. I am used to writing grants. This will not be difficult for me. This is false, of course. So, unless you are used to writing applications for funding from the European Commission, such as the ERC grant. However, then, you are probably not eligible to apply for the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship, as the ERC grant is for advanced scientists. So, at the risk of repeating myself, writing this grant will not come naturally. Saying number two. I can fill 9 pages in no time, I don't need to start early. And you guessed right, it is false again. Although it is easy to fill 9 pages, in this grant the problem is not to write 9 pages, but it is to stick to those 9 pages. You will be required to go into so much detail and to write about so many different things that at the end you will need to cut down completely the fluff that there is. At the end you will be asking yourself, if I reduce the margins by just this little, will I be able to fit in the last sentence? The third saying, which is, you are a woman, you have a higher chance of getting it. Or, well, these days I heard that they are preferring women. And false again. And this one really makes me angry. I heard this in my application phase, and I've also heard it in someone else's application phase. So, if you hear it, don't believe it. And most importantly, do not repeat it. There is no quote of how many men or women should receive this application. So, I have to say, like most people who say this do not have any ill intent. However, this saying just devalues the efforts of women who apply, both if they were successful or not. Mind you, regarding this issue I can fill a whole video. However, I just want to say that women, just like men, are more than capable of writing a successful grant. And if you're a woman and applying, don't let anyone steal your light. Tip number six, press submit frequently. Preferably, one should submit their complete application two weeks before the deadline. However, if you're anything like me, you'll keep on working on it until the very last minute. So the second best thing is to continuously submit the current version as you go along. 
I have to admit this was very scary for me to do the first time because I kept on wondering if this is actually gonna be submitted and it will be considered as the complete application. However, this is not the case. The application can be still modified over time until the deadline. This particular habit is quite handy when the deadline is approaching because at the end the portal will be under heavy use and sometimes when there is heavy traffic uh, the website just breaks down and if it breaks down at the very end there won't be enough time for the European Commission to fix it before the deadline so that if you cannot upload and actualize the very 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 last final version at least there will be the free version right? Yeah, I know what you're thinking, but don't our applications need to be as close to perfect as possible? So how would this help me actually? I agree with you, and my answer to you is this, that towards the end, your application will look more like an actual proposal. However, you will keep on refining the little intricacies, such as spelling mistakes and so on and so forth. So if this is the case, I would prefer that the reviewers would get a version of my proposal with the spelling mistake here and there, rather than no proposal at all. After all, this is not an English test, and if you're in the game, you still have a chance to win. Tip number 7. All sections count. In the MSCA application, all sections count. This we can understand by looking at how the proposal is graded. So just to describe it roughly, the proposal is divided into three main sections and each section is further subdivided and each subdivision has points allocated to it. Together, all of these parts make up 100%. So as you can imagine, each part needs to be as close to flawless as possible, as otherwise you will easily start to lose points. I have heard way too many times saying things like the supervisor you have is amazing for sure you will get it or else uh, you are a first author in a nature science or uh, cell paper for sure you will get it while it is true that if you have those things they will help you get the grant they are not the only things that will determine your success so remember tip number one that you need to put in the time and effort from your side there is no easy way out over here so now that we have discussed this misconception let's discuss a trap that many of us scientists fall into and that is that we focus a lot on the scientific part of the proposal however we tend to ignore some other parts of the grant which we are not so familiar with. Mind you, I also had this problem, but thankfully the LMU contact point pointed this out to me. And while revising my proposal, I realized that I ignored these parts because I either didn't know how to do it or else I really thought that I was clear enough. What I learned is that when my brain did not know how to answer a particular section, it provided me with a rational excuse so that I'll be able to dismiss it and move on. And of course, this creates a blind spot in your judgment, so try Try not to fall for the trap. Tip number 8. Clear time slots. Just starting the application process early is not enough, you also need to take advantage of this time. I think good intentions are a scientist's worst enemy. We always tell ourselves some kind of a lie, such as uh, for sure I will find time to write, I don't need to schedule it, or something on the lines of I'm a great multitasker, I will write it in between experiments. However, trust me, you need to dedicate time for the writing of this proposal consistently. Leaving writing to hope, that is, hope that you will find some time at some point to write, will for sure leave you dealing with the bulk of the work towards the deadline. I know, this is difficult for us scientists to take time away from our research. However, you need to adopt a system that allows you to write daily if possible. As Carl Newport recommends in his book Deep Work, we have to dedicate ourselves to nice, uninterrupted chunks of time so that we enter a flow state that enables us to write something of value. And this is true, at least for me, because I cannot write one or two sentences in between meetings, or if I do, they aren't so great for sure. Furthermore, if possible, write from home or find yourself a nice office space where you're not easily reachable. I find that being available in my office chair always invites people to interrupt, and finding this uninterrupted interrupted time will pay dividends in two ways. First, you have quality time spent on your proposal, as one hour slot is worth more than four 30 minute slots. And secondly, the fact that you require a chunk of time forces you to schedule them in your calendar and therefore making writing consistent. So my advice to you over here is to start regularly making time to write. Tip number nine, your first draft won't be perfect and make peace with it. 
for you to be applying for the Marie Curie grant, most probably you already have some experience in writing, for example your PhD thesis, manuscripts, and also in some cases other grants. In my case I had done all of the above, however when it came to writing this grant, I found that I had to up my writing game even further. The level of detail that one needs to go in, coupled with the concise nature of this application, can be only achieved through training. I really found it hard to deliver this proposal, and when I look back, one thing that I realized that helped me was to not fuss too much on the first draft. To be honest, I thought it was much better than what my feedback suggested. Not being a perfectionist in your first draft is important because, like my first draft, probably yours will suck too. However, you wouldn't know it. <laughs> like me, you would think that you have produced a masterpiece, but in reality, not quite. I find this advice to be very important because the faster you get external feedback, the faster your proposal will get better. Feedback helps you identify your weak spots, and in doing so, your writing will improve. So so if your first draft, like mine, is trash, don't beat yourself up. It's not that you are a bad writer, it just means that you are not experienced in writing a Marie Curie application. Remember, this is a learning experience and probably you will not ace it from the beginning. Well, your ego might be bruised by all of this. However, if you follow this advice, you will emerge a better writer. And for sure, your grant will thank you for it. Tip number 10. Take no vacation towards the end. Now please, do not misunderstand me, I am not promoting some toxic work culture where you should never take any holidays. However, when you are writing an MSCA application, do yourself a favor and do not book any holidays starting from mid-August uh, till the end of the deadline in September. Yeah, I know, you might tell yourself that you're really good at time management, and maybe you are, but trust me, in this process you are gonna meet with many curveballs and many things will not go as planned, leaving on holiday knowing fully well that you still need to work on your grant will not let you enjoy your holiday in peace. And in fact, these thoughts will keep on roaming in your brain for the whole duration of your trip. And when you will come back, you will come more tired than when you left. So something that I like to tell myself is, sometimes self-care is just doing the work that needs to be done. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I know it was a bit long, but I hope that you got some value from it. If you want to hear more science advice, just hit the like and subscribe button. And if you are afraid of starting this Marie Curie application journey, or maybe thinking of quitting halfway through, you might like this video over here. Hopefully it can help you overcome your fear. So with this, I wish you all the best of luck with your application, and thanks for watching. Ciao!